All right, so um, welcome to uh, a, a special uh, talk, uh, tech talk for um, Google at Santa Monica. And uh, we have a special guest here, uh, Brian Lintot, who is uh, the former director of the uh, Ferrymead Historic Park. Exactly. Historic Park in New Zealand. And it's what, where in New Zealand is in it? In Christchurch, in South Christchurch. Island. In Christchurch. And um, he has done uh, quite a bit of research on Antarctica and historic preservation there. And uh, he'll be discussing that as well as uh, spinning out from there and talking about uh, historic preservation in areas beyond. So I give the floor to Brian. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, good afternoon, and thank you for coming along. I'd like to begin with asking you to imagine something. Long decades have passed, no humans have visited the heroic sites where previously the world's attention was focused. There's an extraordinary range of artifacts that have been left, transport, scientific equipment, and just the general remains of human activity. Then one day, a transport vehicle arrives on its side very proudly displayed as the emblem of the United States. The craft lands, but during one of the landings, they have a problem. The visual conditions are so strange that people are unable to measure distance easily. They're able to recover part of the equipment from the earlier expedition and use it to get back to their main base. The year is 1947, and the crew from the USS Burton, part of Operation High Jump, have visited Captain Scott's Discovery Hut another 30 years since any human being had been there. In many ways, the heroic era explorations of Antarctica are similar to the Apollo mission in the 1960s. Both of them happened in times of great international tension, with nations wanting to show their prowess and their moral superiority through scientific endeavor and brave exploration. They also drew deep on cultural themes. So we have astronauts in Apollo, we have Odyssey, Nimrod, and Terra Nova. And also they played with current themes of discovery, endurance, and Aquarius and Snoopy. Scott and Shackleton now are as much cultural icons in management school theory as they are historical characters. Both endeavors sent people to the very edge of where humans could go. In this case, Amundsen, the first human to arrive at the South Pole, where they would pay homage to their nation's flag. Fortitude, though, is another quality that the people had to have who undertook these great endeavors. Here we have Shackleton's ship, trapped in the ice, slowly being crushed, destroying any hope of his plan to get across the uh, Antarctic continent through the South Pole from the Atlantic Sea to the Pacific Ocean. And here we have the service module from Apollo 13, when one of the oxygen tanks had exploded. Both parties were able to utilize very small things that had no real purpose for saving them in the situation that they were suddenly found themselves in. Here we have the James Keard, a little ship, a boat that's now been preserved, which sailed across the Southern Ocean so Shackleton could inform the world where his party were marooned and arranged the rescue, ensuring that not one person in that party lost their life. And here we have the lunar lander from Apollo 13, which was able to supply power and some oxygen so that the astronauts were able to return safely to the Earth. Sadly, both endeavors had great tragic loss. Um, three American astronauts lost their life in a ground test when the oxygen-filled capsule of Apollo 1 caught fire. And in a similar way, although at the absolute opposite end of the world and in temperature, Captain Scott lost his life with his party. Within the English-speaking world, and specifically the British Empire and the Commonwealth, Captain Scott's legacy got very much embedded within the history of the time, and is a very fascinating cultural marker which has moved its way through the last century. What you're looking at here is a memorial window from Christchurch, New Zealand, and at the top of it are the various ideals of truth and beauty, and the middle of it are a range of historical characters, predominantly from British history, and down the bottom, a fine line of New Zealand troops is fighting brutality and ignorance, the Red Dragons. But when you look closer, front and centre, next to Captain Cook, the European discoverer of New Zealand, you find Captain Scott. And so in this period before the First World War, you had the disaster with the Titanic, 
Then the news came that Captain Scott and his party had perished, and then the First World War came along. And culturally, two things happened. The first was that Scott himself was writing himself into the cultural construction of the time. So he had a friend, Barry, and Barry wrote a book called Peter Pan, based on the play that he'd written. And in Peter Pan, Wendy says to the lost boys, your mothers hope that you die the death of an English gentleman. And when Captain Oates decided to walk out of the tent, realizing that he was injured and holding up the party, and literally walked to his death, Scott wrote, he died the death of an English gentleman. And at the time, within what was very much a British imperial, they had a term called muscular Christianity um, environment, the sacrifice was very much understood as being a Christian one. What happened with the film that was made of Captain Scott was that it was showed to the British troops on the Western Front during the First World War. And so the death of English gentlemen then became something of an industrial scale. And so the trauma of the First World War, especially in the European British Commonwealth context, meant that Scott got very solidly embedded within the public understanding. By the 60s and 70s, though, with a very sort of you know, iconoclast view coming through, um, it was time for parody in terms of popular culture. So Monty Python did a um, Scott of the Sahara filmed on a beach down in Devon. Then in the 80s, there was a book came thundering out that Scott was a total fool, and then other Antarctic explorers responded. And so now we're in this period of history where you go from the great hero, the debunking, and now the nuanced debate. Antarctica itself, if you get the opportunity to visit, I would highly recommend it as a sublimely beautiful place. Um, you'll learn two things. The first is that within yourself, you have more fortitude, more character, more strength and resilience than you ever thought you had before. Um, if you're an American, you have a 1 in 125,000 chance going down on the National Science Foundation program, or you can go down as a tourist. Um, you find this inner strength, and then you look out at the huge vastness of Antarctica, and you feel like an ant on a football field. And so you learn these two quite contradictory things at the same time. As a territory, it's quite unusual, and one of the great achievements of the Eisenhower administration was to put in place a treaty. Uh, south of South America, Argentina, Chile, and Britain each claim competing areas of Antarctica. The United States' position towards claiming Antarctica is that an expedition was sent down there during President Jackson's presidency, and um, ironically, some people from that turned up in New Zealand as the main founding treaty of New Zealand was being signed. Uh, the Russians also sent down an expedition, so they claim this kind of idea of being there as well. The American position is simple, though. Effective occupancy, which they have without a doubt the highest percentage of activity in Antarctica, is the claim for territoriality. But in a sense, territoriality is an absurdity, and, and this comes up with the moon as well. H how do you claim the moon? What does it mean? It's not like going west and deciding that you know, you're going to add some more to the United States. So everything was put on hold under the Antarctic Treaty. And the fundamental idea is that Antarctica is a zone of peace, but the military can provide transport and logistical support, and scientific research is the main activity in Antarctica. And when you read the uh, autobiographies, for example, of Admiral Dufek of the United States Navy, what comes through very clearly is that they'd been through two wars, the Second World War and the Korean War, and there was this real sense of pride that they were doing something that was positive. That had enough of war and of bloodshed and sacrifice and suffering and death. In Antarctica, they felt that they were making new discoveries. They were going to improve the value of human life around the world and the quality of it. And you get this very strong idealistic view coming through. Uh, the territorial claims are set aside during the treaty. Um, as we do in our interpersonal relationships quite often, we agree to disagree and to put something on hold and sort it out later. Decisions are based on consensus between the countries. Um, so decisions can take a long time to arrive at, but when you finally get there, everybody's on board. And there's Antarctic law for each nation. So for example, if I was to damage and pilfer from a historic hut, I would be prosecuted under New Zealand law. Um, presumably the majority of you would be prosecuted under American law. Uh, the American law is quite fascinating. Uh, basically a federal agent who is authorized can arrest you, search you, um, have you essentially imprisoned and deported from the continent without a warrant. 
Um, there's no mucking about whatsoever. Very similar with New Zealand. Uh, there don't seem to be very many cases, though, of problems of lawlessness down there. First of all, the people that are chosen to go down um, have a high level of motivation to be there, so they're not going to be silly, uh, let alone criminal. Uh, in addition, if you do anything really stupid, you simply get locked out of your nation's Antarctic program and your Antarctic access is very difficult from there on in. One of the things with the heroic era huts is that they have a very strong sense of presence about them. Uh, for example, Sir Neil Cousins, the Chair of English Heritage, says that they are the most tangible heritage sites on the planet. And time and time again, you get these reports coming back that things aren't quite the same there in terms of time and space as they are in the rest of the world. And I think one of the reasons is that or several of them. You have to be highly motivated to go there, and you'll probably have a good knowledge of it. In addition, the normal signifiers of time don't count. Uh, when I was down there last January, um, the sun just goes round and round the horizon. You know, you wake up and um, it's the morning, so the sun's over there and it's midday, and then it's time for a meal, and then you might wake up in the night and the sun's down there. It, it's just going round and round, so that day-night thing isn't working. Um, in addition, there's no spiders, so there's no cobwebs, and the environment outside you is so strange. You know, it's just like nothing else. Um, someone referred to it as a reductionist environment, and it is. You're, the lack of stimulation you're getting puts you into quite a strange headspace. But what we have here is a photo from Scott's second expedition, and they're going into the hut from Shackleton's first expedition. And one of the things they identify is the fact that the food is still edible. And decades later, the food is still edible down there. As part of my research, I had the privilege of interviewing Sir Edmund Hillary a year and a half ago. He's recently passed away. And um, he told me the story, which is in the public domain already, of seeing Shackleton's ghost. And he said, I don't believe in ghosts and spirits, but I walked into Shackleton's hut and there he was, his arms were outstretched, and he was smiling and welcoming me, and I got such a shock I fell backwards out the door. And it was wonderful that he had told me this story personally, but then I talked to his wife afterwards, and a really interesting aspect was she said that as Ed gets older, he's thinking about what immortality means. Is there a spiritual aspect to life or will people like Ed Hillary, who was a real fan of Shackleton, imagine in the future, when they're on top of Mount Everest, seeing Ed Hillary up there? And he has been a great supporter of preserving these huts in Antarctica. And his last great trip of his life was when the American Air Force um, flew him down to Antarctica. And I was there a few weeks beforehand, and everyone was saying, Ed will find a way to stay here a bit longer. And sure enough, he did. And he did that late, great, last great journey and then came home. When Admiral Byrd of the United States Navy wrote for the National Geographic in the 1940s, he commented on the fact that the timber seemed in exceptionally good condition. And this was one of the things that surprised people, was that they were able to pick up rope that had been used for ponies and use that to hold down the helicopters um, from the American ships. But one of the problems you find when you're dealing with a historic site is that sometimes you'll have layers, and in this case there literally is a layer of blubbery, sooty smoke over all the building. So the first expeditions that came were very well planned, very well equipped, they had heating and so on, but then there was a later expedition, and most people will know about Shackleton and his ship getting crushed in the ice in the Atlantic side. On the Pacific side, there was what was called the Ross Sea Party, and the Ross Sea Party went ashore, and a storm blew up, and their ship got washed out to sea, swept out. And the ship managed to make it back, but they were marooned. And to stay alive, they had to kill seals and burn the fat. So what you have are these two very distinct and very different phases of history, and how you deal with those layers of history can be a very, very strong debating topic. A lot of artifacts have been left there over the years. And interestingly, some of these artifacts have been used for scientific research. So, for example, they got the fuel from Captain Scott and his expedition, and this, some of the last surviving examples of petroleum from 1910 are down in Antarctica. Other petroleum's just been used or thrown away, and the environment being so cold and so dry means a lot of things have been preserved. 
Uh, here we have one of the conservators working down there. Um, there's an organisation called the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust, and they have uh, up to six conservators at any time. Uh, Getty Foundation here have provided some funding towards this project. There are some health and safety risks besides the danger of Antarctica. Uh, Scott's ponies had anthrax, and the spores are still viable, although they're now deep underground. Um, lead, a whole range of different things. When they were doing a clean-up, they dropped a bottle of ether and decided it was time to all go outside and let a bit of wind go through. Um, there's morphine, cocaine, laudanum, and opium in the medical kits. And so whether you leave those historic items in place or whether you take them off the continent has been an ongoing debate. Global warming has caused issues as well. Um, what's happened here is that the snow and ice have melted. So even though the very core of Antarctica is getting colder, and the reason for that is as more moisture goes in the atmosphere and it goes south and it hits the freezing line, it turns to snow and ice. So the massive snow and ice is building, pulling the core temperature down. The extremities at the uh, coast, especially the Antarctic Peninsula, are starting to warm up. And this has happened where these huts are. And so as soon as you get water, chemical and biological um, issues become very serious with conservation. So there were very distinctive phases with these heroic era huts. In the 50s, a lot of base personnel, and I must say New Zealanders and Americans, were pilfering artifacts. But the interesting thing is when you talk to a lot of people, they didn't see it as something really bad. They saw it as a special token of the fact that they'd been to Antarctica. But things had got a little bit out of hand. And so in the late 50s, there was a very strong decision made by the New Zealanders that if they restored the huts to look something like a lived-in museum, then people would understand them more. And there'd been big piles of rubbish, and of course that'd been cleaned up because, you know, the rubbish didn't fit in with the ideas and so forth. My research indicates that a lot of ideas were taken from Colonial Williamsburg. Um, a lot of the same language is used about making a lived-in historical site. In 87, the Antarctic Heritage Trust was established with professional conservation. Um, the pressure from tourism is controlled with only 2,000 visits a year, eight in the huts at a minimum. But there's a real tension in Antarctica, and that is between the scientists, because there are a limited number of seats on the plane, and uh, the heritage community. And very much, uh, I got told in no uncertain terms, Antarctica is there for science. Paradoxically, though, when you go to the scientific laboratories, you'll find old scientific equipment from the 1950s, which has been used for continuous monitoring of the environment. And essentially, this is a mini museum. It's old equipment, it has an interpretation panel on it, um, it has a map, it has something to give it some context. So in the 1950s, the undertaking was called the International Geophysical Year. And it was a great idea. There was a dinner party here in America with uh, Van Allen um, as the host. And the idea came up of, well, look, we've got all this technology from the Second World War. Why don't we have another polar year and look at these extreme environments where previously it was very difficult to do research. So the territorial claims were put on hold. This was just before the treaty. And by every measure, it was a great success. At the same time, there was this kind of end of empire um, expedition, though, being done by the British. And this was to achieve what Shackleton had failed to do, set up a base in the Atlantic side of the continent and then go across via the South Pole to the Pacific side. Vivian Fuchs was the British commander of it, and Sir Edmund Hillary, would, who had recently conquered Everest, would lay depots between Ross Island on the Pacific side and a point 500 miles from the South Pole. So essentially, Fuchs would be up at the top left and would go across to the center, and Hillary would be in the bottom center, and he would go up and then stop short of the South Pole. Fuchs had these wonderful snowcat uh, vehicles um, designed for traveling on snow. Hillary had some Massey Ferguson tractors, which had been adapted with these tracks. Very difficult to drive, but affordable. And here we have Admiral Dufek, uh, first commander of Operation Deep Freeze, and Ed Hillary just before they set off. And one of the things that we're working on in New Zealand at the moment is setting up a Hillary Dufek Fellowship. 
because the personal friendship between these two actually started the whole relationship between the United States and New Zealand and Antarctica. Originally, the New Zealand base was going to be 30 miles away. Dufek said, look, we're all getting on so well, why don't you build your base next to us? And um, in terms of logistics, that's been great, uh, but also just in terms of that cooperation, it's been a great success for New Zealand science. And um, it's worked out very well for the Americans also. Hillary went forward with his uh, tractors and fuel was being dropped in. An interesting bit of the geopolitics was that the British were also doing this, and this has turned up in the British archives, to show their territorial claim to Antarctica. And rather cheekily, the Americans um, agreed to help the New Zealanders with their plan, which was to drive to the South Pole first. So Admiral Dufek had some fuel brought down from New Zealand by ship. It was swept off the ship, so he had some flowing down. And then the Royal New Zealand Air Force were making these depots. Um, Hillary got to within 500 miles of the pole, and um, as we were talking about it, he said, what did they expect? I'm an adventurer and an explorer. Hillary thought that Fuchs was not even going to make it to the South Pole before the summer season ended. So um, basically there were some telegrams went backwards and forwards. One of these telegrams was accidentally released to the media um, in a pile of other media releases. And suddenly there was another race to the South Pole. Uh, before it had been Norway and Great Britain, um, now it was Great Britain and New Zealand. In a sense there wasn't really a race. Um, Fuchs had been doing a very steady pace. Um, Hillary had done everything he had to do, so off he went. And as you can tell from the photograph, when the two leaders met at the South Pole, several weeks later when Fuchs finally made it, uh, there was a little bit of tension between the two of them. On the other hand, the New Zealanders were very pleased because they had shown that within their territorial claim, they could drive from the coast to the South Pole. The Americans were thrilled that they'd cemented this relationship with the New Zealanders in the area. And thanks to the route that Hillary had actually plotted through the crevasses, Fuchs was able to finish his plan on time as well. Sadly though, not all things in Antarctica have come to a happy end. And in the late 1970s, there was growing concern. And that was that with tourism flights which flew over Antarctica with people looking, that uh, not actually landing, that there could be very, very serious issues if there was to be a crash. So the Antarctic countries get together each year, um, or every second year originally, they meet, they discuss the issues, and this was the recommendation that was going out, that clearly communications were not good, the air traffic control um, system was designed for the military, it didn't have the capacity for large civilian um, operations as well, and that if there was going to be an emergency landing, they weren't even sure that the bases would have enough food to feed 200, 300 people if um, blizzards came in and so on. Well, sadly, the tragedy in 1979 was that a DC-10 flew into Mount Erebus and with the loss of 257 lives. And so at the next meeting, Recalling with respect the years of exploration and research, many have traveled and worked in Antarctica and not returned. And they very, very pro appropriately and correctly acknowledge the great work that the New Zealanders and Americans did, trying to recover you know, the remains. They express their sympathy and recommended that the site become a tomb because there are still the remains of humans there. And so that area of Antarctica is totally sealed off. There's a memorial area next to it, which has a memorial for ceremonies um, of remembrance, but no one flies over it, and it's just totally like a graveyard. And in a strange way, it's not a bad graveyard. Because when you look at Mount Erebus, and I was talking to someone who lost a friend in this tragedy, it's, it's sublimely beautiful. It's like when you look at you know, the images of Mount Fuji by Hokusai. And in terms of someone's final resting place, the end was swift, thank God. And in addition to that, it has a real beauty and serenity to it. It's also interesting when you talk to people who have been to Antarctica because Mount Erebus, especially from the American perspective, New Zealand's perspective, our bases are down at the bottom of it. And it's like a reference point in this huge white vastness. Mount Erebus is this place that you refer to in your mind and you get quite an affinity with it. 
Um, the Antarctic Treaty Consultative meetings recently criticized the amount of shipborne tourism going down to Antarctica. And last year, with no loss of life or injury, a ship dedicated to sailing in polar waters sunk when it was um, South America, it had gone south from there and hit what was called a growler and um, it ripped a hole in the hull and sunk very, very quickly. And so these huge cruise ships are going down there uh, from South America, they take them down from Alaska and there's a range of issues in terms of search and rescue. Um, the waters are uncharted, it's absolutely treacherous with the weather and simply the capacity to rescue large numbers of people is not there. So if you want to go to Antarctica, um, I don't know if Google will set up something down there, it'd be great fun if they did. Uh, you'll start off probably in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, which the guys on the International Space Station are kindly pointing at, and that's down the bottom left. Um, Christchurch is very lucky. Scott, Shackleton, uh, Admiral Byrd, and Operation Deep Freeze have all gone through there over the years. Uh, chances are you'll fly down on an American C-17. And one of the things that really, you know, poignantly I was aware of was that you were allowed up on the flight deck. And since 9-11, when the flight deck is now this kind of armoured enclave where no one gets to see except the pilots and the flight crew, we've really lost something. And I think the two things that we've lost is the incredible view you get out the front of a plane. You know, you can see why people are pilots just for the look of it. And then the other thing is that that sense of camaraderie, the collegial feel of you're all going on a big trip together. And pilots love to talk about their aeroplanes. Um, so in this situation, you can get up on the flight deck, they'll happily chat to you for hours about it all. Um, it's a C-17 crew, uh, they've been up in Iraq and Afghanistan, so this was you know, a welcome change of pace for them. And then finally you'll arrive over Antarctica and look out. Um, you actually leave in the middle of summer, so you're looking at about 80 degrees um, when you leave Christchurch, and you've got to go out with all your emergency clothing on in case the plane goes down. Um, so everyone's kind of sweating away and carrying these huge coats. I think I, you can get down to about minus 30 or 40 in these clothes that you're wearing. When you do arrive down there, um, you walk out onto the ice runway. Uh, down the bottom left you'll see Santa Claus, part of the flight crew. Uh, people are color coded. Uh, Kiwis are blue, the Americans are red, National Science Foundation. Uh, the Italians set up a program and um, just really classy clothes. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, you jump on Ivan the terror bus. Uh, it's about 16 miles and that'll take you across the ice shelf and then you'll go up onto the island. Uh, the New Zealand base, um, New Zealand is very much into their green. Uh, we did have the orange and red of the British, but in the 1960s we sort of moved further and further away from that historical connection. And uh, the base is designed in little modules, uh, so if there's a fire they can section off one module. And fire is a huge danger in Antarctica, it's a desert. Uh, all the water is frozen, um, you can't chip away at ice and throw it at a fire. And so I was there when there was a fire alarm and just unbelievable, you know, the level of activity to make sure that nothing got out of control. Uh, on the other side, um, there's sort of like, it's, it's really strange, you spend 12 hours flying between Auckland, New Zealand and Los Angeles and you've gone from one world to another. Uh, here there's a 12 minute uh, little shuttle ride and so we drive on the left and in the corridors we walk on the left. Uh, you go across to McMurdo and you walk on the corridors on the right hand side. Um, there's ATM machines, um, there's American bathrooms which are slightly different from our ones. Uh, the accents are obviously different. The only frustrating thing was I went to the bar and I thought, great, I can get some American beer. And they said, uh, we have Otago Spates and we have uh, Canterbury DB and these are all New Zealand beers. They don't bring American beers down. So they've got a great coffee shop over there. Uh, you meet lots of good folk there and they've got a bar with appalling karaoke, which I would suggest you avoid at all costs. Um, the internet link, not a lot of broadband, but reasonably continuous. Uh, the New Zealanders and Americans do have two big satellite dishes. I think they're only about mm, three or four degrees above the horizon to actually get around the curvature of the Earth. And one of the satellites did go down, so there were a few issues. In contrast, at South Pole Station, they have to go between, I think, six or seven that pop up above the horizon. So nothing like broadband, but you can send some basic files backwards and forwards. Um, 
aerial exploration, uh, this is Captain Scott using a balloon. Um, basically, they had an instruction manual. They got him up to 1,500 feet and nearly let him go, and then um, he decided it was time to come down. And in his first expedition, then Shackleton went up and used aerial photography. Nowadays, NASA, to do a proof of concept, uh, as well as some real astronomy as well, um, sends up these helium balloons. You could fit about four jumbo jets in that. And there's a little wee pod underneath. It might be, for example, an X-ray telescope. And what they will do is uh, send it up to 100,000 feet, and then there's a big current of air goes around Antarctica. Um, you send it up for two or three weeks. When you get back over where the base is, you push a button, uh, the pod drops down, the parachute deploys, and you get all the data down. So while it's actually up at altitude, they can download about 1% of the data to other uh, satellites. When it comes into line of sight, they can download another 20% of the data. And so they use that to check that the operational parameters are being adhered to. And then when the whole pod comes down, you get everything. But they did have a problem when I was there, and that is one of these pods came down, but then the parachute didn't detach. And uh, a wind came up, and they found it 100 miles away down a crevasse. And it was a $10 million experiment. Um, so they sent out a rescue crew, a search and rescue crew, to go down and get the hard drives. <laughs> Uh, it's a place to do art, and um, artistic programs are becoming more popular down there. National Science Foundation has one. Uh, this is a California artist, uh, Lita Albuquerque. She's based here. And um, these balls actually represented the stars above in the summer solstice, which ironically you couldn't see because the sun was just going round and round the horizon. Uh, there was an astronomer, uh, he was in the red jacket there, and he with his GPS could actually go and say, oh, you're a Virgo, come on, I'll show you where Virgo is, and he'd go over. Um, the neat thing about this was that it started off as these blue balls, um, they're anchored into the snow, and, and they were all on the surface, but Antarctica sort of consumes things, and by the time we'd got there, you could see some of the balls were starting to sort of, you know, go under. Um, the environmental regulations are very strong, so at the end of the artwork, photographed from ground level and air level, um, everything was taken away. And when you go out into the field now, um, there's very strict environmental protocols, um, so everything goes back, and you know, you sort of start to get an affinity with astronauts. Um, this was my little um, bit of interior decorating, uh, the clear minimalist influence of Le Corbusier with the white surfaces, the Gothic Revival reading knock alluded to at the end, and uh, the plastic Pacifica flowers to put a bit of color, uh, just a little snow cave. And I was reading Admiral Byrd's book called Alone, and in the 1930s, a little America base was established at the uh, edge of the ice shelf. He went 100 miles inland, set up a meteorological station and wintered over. And it's a fascinating book to read because he's just a person alone, coming to terms with himself, taking a break from the hurly-burly. But then what happens is that um, carbon monoxide from the oven starts to poison him. And he realizes this, but if he doesn't have the oven, he doesn't have heat and he freezes. And he's trying to convince everybody back at the coast that he's okay. But the messages are getting crazier and crazier, the radio messages. And they're under strict orders not to do a rescue. And, you know, this was the Navy, the 1930s. You know, the order was the Admiral will not be rescued if he's made this decision. Um, having said that, it got so crazy that they decided that they were going to do a um, tour of inland areas to look at meteorites, and while they were in the area, they were going to pop in and see them. <laughs> and this book alone is fascinating to read, and when you actually, like I did, sit inside the Ross Ice Shelf, hearing your heart beat, reading this book, you know, that contextual learning is superb. And um, over on our right, this is a little meteorological station we set up and did some data research with. A lot of, there, there's a strange area called the Dry Valleys, um, very similar to um, other planets in terms of not a lot of life. Well, you know, we assume there's life on other ones. Uh, dusty, gritty, and when I was down there, I met a guy from Kansas University who'd been working on remote controlled aircraft in extreme environments. A lot of stuff that NASA will use on Mars, they'll take down to Antarctica. And they've got that separation, the extreme environment, 
And now things have actually come around 180 degrees because people are saying, well, why don't we just use the same technology in Antarctica? You know, it's a dangerous place. Uh, it's expensive to take people down there. So why don't we just have a rover trundling up and down one of these dry valleys, taking little biological samples throughout the year? Uh, back at McMurdo Station, um, this is a really cool guy, George, uh, is at Madison, Wisconsin. And he's probably the most highly qualified guy with a soldering iron on the planet. Uh, he runs meteorological stations all around Antarctica. Uh, this is his way of getting down there. And this whole idea of remote sensing is very, very big and is growing more and more as time goes by. If you go out into the field, uh, you'll go on one of these small little planes. Or if you're heading off to the South Pole, um, thanks to the United States Air Force, and uh, there's an Air National Guard unit um, up in New York State, and they fly to Greenland and the Arctic, and then they swap around for the other half of the air and come down south. Everything at the moment is flown into the South Pole, although they have experimented with a um, route, uh, road or a routeway. The very first plane to land at the South Pole was K. Sarah Sarah. This is now in Pensacola in a museum naval aviation, and they were the first people there since Scott had left. Nowadays, if you get down to South Pole Station, um, the original base set up in the 1950s is underground. Uh, it's just kind of melted its way down, snow's built up. Uh, extraordinary place, this is the absolute edge. You're at about 13,000 uh, feet of elevation. Uh, your brain isn't working as well as it normally should because uh, your body's desperately trying to survive. And you'll see over on the right, there's a geodesic dome. Uh, which was put up in the 1970s, and then the new base to the left is actually on pylons, so it can be elevated up. So a huge amount of science going on down there at the moment. To get supplies there, though, can be tricky. Uh, the Hercules are very expensive to fly down. Uh, there was an unfortunate incident where someone at the South Pole broke the jaw of someone else at the South Pole, and they had to put a special flight in, and it was you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars for this one particular flight. Uh, here we have a C-17 doing an airdrop. So Antarctic science, you're looking at the birth and nature of the universe, climate change, and life in extreme environments. South Pole Telescope um, will be coming online. I think they've just got first light on it. Uh, things are so cold there that the secondary mirror actually docks with the building, and people can internally get access to it. And I think it was at Berkeley, some of the sensor arrays, they were still developing the technology for it as they built the telescope. Uh, one plane load with 5,000 bolts uh, was involved, as well as plane load after plane load to take all this down. Good one to look up on the internet is called uh, Ice Cube. Um, believe it or not, this is actually a telescope. Um, it is 2,400 meters under the surface of the South Pole, and it's really interested in neutrinos that are coming through the North Pole, so that the planet is filtering out the local neutrinos. And it's this great question in science, where do neutrinos come from? Um, you know, is it from around a black hole where there might be, you know, kind of energy being built up as mass is whirling around? Uh, is it from stars exploding? Is it from somewhere else altogether? Um, this is actually a line in the federal budget of, uh, I think, about $250 million. So the idea is that you drop these uh, ropes down and they have pods on them. And then you have an array of all of these pods. And when a neutrino comes through, there's a secondary effect of a blue flash and you can find out the direction of where that neutrino came from. And if there's a whole swarm of them, then you can inform astronomers and ask them to position, say, in an extreme case, Hubble, towards that region of space and try and figure out just what is going on there which is creating this effect that you're picking up at the South Pole. This is a project called Andril. Um, why is nature the way it is? Um, there was this wonderful section of geological um, time which was squeezed very, very tightly. So it wasn't five kilometers deep, it was one kilometer deep. And um, of course it had to be under 80 meters of ice and then 900 meters of water. And the ice had to move up and down a meter with the tide. It couldn't be on the land. Um, such things happen. So there was New Zealand engineering involved in this, Italian, German, and American funding. And what they've retrieved is a core sample. It's a kilometer long. And so what we're looking at here is sitting on the ice. They've reamed a hole with this kind of hot water sleeve. Then they've put a 900-meter pipe 
anchored it to the sea floor, and then using mineral drilling technology, they've gone down. And so you can see here with the sample that's been cut in half and immediately recorded, you get these different strata. And depending on the climate, you'll get different things. So for example, um, if there's an ice shelf overhead, the ice shelf rips off big bits of rock. And as the bottom of it melts, those big rocks will drop down, comparatively big. Um, if there's no ice shelf but there's glaciers, the glaciers are ripping stuff down and you'll get a certain type of sediment. If there's fast moving rivers, a different sediment again. And then also if you get into the fossils, you'll actually be able to see what fossils are there from what um, type of environment was there. So this will help with climate change research because you'll be able to get a better understanding of well, what is normal for the Earth's environment. Uh, biological research has been going on, and one debate that goes on in the science in Antarctica is longitudinal studies. So should you always be doing new, fresh, and exciting things, which may help you get some funding, or should you just keep doing the same research again and again and see how changes happen? And both of those have strong cases, you know, case-by-case -case basis. And one of the things is seeing uh, the buildup of things like DDT uh, in mammals in Antarctica. So you start off with a pristine environment and then you see how the modern age impacts upon um, life forms down there. Now it's with global warming to see what happens there. Uh, here's an image from space. This anomaly here in the center was quite strange and people wanted to know more. Originally there'd been a proposal to take atomic waste in the 1960s, uh, put it on the surface in Antarctica, let it melt through and just sit on the bottom until it had um, decayed. Well, it's really good they didn't do that because it turns out there's a system of rivers and lakes underneath Antarctica. And this is called Lake Vostok. Um, the Russians were drilling, getting a core sample of ice, and much to their stunned amazement with this um, radar telemetry from space and from aircraft, they found out there was a lake underneath. And so NASA are now looking at this um, in the context of Europa and the Jovian moon in which there may be life underneath the ice, and so how do you get through to it? Now there's a huge debate about whether in fact you may contaminate the life um, that's been there for an awfully long time with modern biological material. Antarctica, some of you may even be consuming it now. Um, Bioprospecting has become a huge industry um, internationally, and in Antarctica they found that there were these proteins which stopped ice particles forming, uh, which fish had in them. They modified those, and now they're putting them in various ice creams and chocolates in America. So you have a creamier chocolate, and um, the um, ice cream is more smooth. <laughs> So looking at the types of historic sites and monuments you have, um, the history of heritage is that, as mentioned, the personnel are told to treat them as shrines. Under the Antarctic Treaty, there's a developing system which parallels the UNESCO United Nations one, saying they're historic sites and tombs, things are formalized. And there's also a very clever thing being put in, saying, well, we're not sure of what everything is, so if we don't know, and it's pre-1958, let's just wait do some research, and then move on. Now the Madrid Protocol set up Antarctica as a very solidly environmentally focused place. Up until then there'd been a lot of science, but there'd also been a lot of waste and rubbish and so on. So now the Committee for Environmental Protection looks after the historic sites and monuments. It has area plans and so forth. With the history of heritage though, it's important to remember that there's a big desire to remove a lot of things from Antarctica. So you've got 10 years to remove it before it becomes historic, is what one environmental person told me. The geopolitics of Antarctica dictate a lot of things, and one of them is the heritage. Here at the front, we have Captain Scott's hut. At the back, we have the American base. Now this hut is of modest significance, it's important to keep it there, but also it's a very polite reminder that the British and New Zealand connection in Antarctica was there well before the Americans arrived. So you have the traditional historic sites, the bases of Scott and Shackleton. Here you have a monument to Admiral Byrd. Admiral Byrd's bases were on ice, which is subsequently broken away and melted, so there's no physical remains of the Little America bases. Um, so this statue here at McMurdo commemorates Byrd and all of his achievements. Here's the hut put up by Ed Hillary, the first New Zealand base uh, in the 1950s. 
Now this isn't where an historic site or monument is, but it could be. Norway has claimed that the tent left by Amundsen is an historic site. In South America, Chile and Argentina have competing claims. Argentina drove to the South Pole first, so the Argentinian flagpole uh, which they put up, which has subsequently been lost in the ice and snow, is also claimed as an historic site. So are these what we would normally consider valid historic sites and monuments? Well, perhaps not, but in the context of Antarctica, they can have great meaning. At the moment, there's a big debate about uh, this geodesic dome. Uh, there was a plan to dismantle it and bring it back to the United States and put it in a museum for the Seabees. With budgets at federal level now being so tight, uh, there's talk of actually just demolishing it. And so you can expect a big debate over that within the Antarctic community in the coming years. A lot of artifacts have actually been brought back from the ice or are down there still and could be put in a museum. In this case, a, a US Navy Constellation plane. This was actually buried under ice and snow, but as the hot summers at McMurdo have become hotter, it started to re-emerge. And there have been cases of planes being retrieved and brought back to museums. Um, you can see here the graffiti, which gives you some idea of the melting pattern over the years. If you want to take one of these planes back, though, you've got to melt the ice and snow, and there's a huge cost involved there. Uh, in New York City, there's a small memorial to Lincoln Ellsworth, the first person, an American, who flew across the continent. And in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, we have a totem pole carved in Oregon and the very first hangar. Um, historic sites and airports are kind of, airports are like an ongoing construction zone now, and there's already plans to relocate this, which is a pity because it is such a physical reminder. Here we have an Australian plane that flew in Antarctica. It only flew once, but it was restored, and again, it's geopolitical. It reminds people that you know, Antarctica is also an Australian endeavor. In my former museum in Christchurch, we have United States Navy DC-3. And one of the fun things is with archaeology, you can sand back the layers of paint. So what you'll see here is there's the uh, tiki. Um, you can see the remains of a kiwi. But in Antarctica, this plane was called Mother Goose. Mother Goose was at the front of the plane. Down the back, you can just make out at the top left, there's kind of like a curved shape to the left, and then like a little beak, and uh, there was the goose. And the goose's buttocks were um, positioned around the exhaust of the auxiliary power unit, so its buttocks went boom, 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 boom. Um, they decided that was a little um, <coughs> not quite fit for the fine people of Christchurch, so it got painted over. <laughs> One of the issues with museums and heritage is when you get these things that don't really have a site as such. Um, a lot of research was done about the ozone hole, discovering it in Antarctica, and then monitoring it. So with the ozone hole, you have this incredible situation of humans realize that they're changing the planet, and they collectively agree to change what they're doing in terms of fluorocarbons to heal the damage. Now, that's a pivotal point in human history. Um, this is one of the NASA planes uh, that did part of that research. So keeping that plane in a museum in the future, I think, is very important. So why is Antarctica way cool? The human stories of the heroic age of Scott do tend to resonate, and I think they will throughout the years to come. If you've got $35,000 spare and you'd like to fly to the South Pole for four or five hours, um, you can go down there as a tourist, or you can go on one of the cruise ships for a lot less. We've just had an international polar year, although that's mainly focused on the Arctic and how indigenous cultures will cope with global warming. It is flying at the absolute extreme. Um, you know, it really is the edge of where humans can go. And in addition to that, Penguins are just way cool and everybody loves them. Um, I took this photograph last year, put it in a competition and won $1,000. So, you know, <laughs> that's great. So with Antarctic Air and Space Heritage, you know, clearly Air and Space Technologies opened Antarctica up. Important discoveries have been made. It's analogous to some extraterrestrial environments and where concepts are tested. And the aviation history provides deep insights into human bravery and endeavor. Um, one of the things that I found quite moving was they had to do a rescue of somebody at the South Pole and in the middle of winter, and the pilots walked out, and the whole base was lined up to shake their hand. And that's when the pilots knew how dangerous it was, that they were absolutely at the edge. 
Antarctic has always been used as an analogy of uh, the lunar environment. People like von Braun went down there, a lot of other folk from NASA, and it is because it is so extreme and so different. So as you may have guessed, when it comes to lunar issues, um, there will be big debates. There is an Antarctic Treaty, there is a Space Treaty, but the Moon Treaty has not been signed um, and specifically by the United States. So will the Moon just be for peace and science? Will it be for the benefit of all people? If there are resources there, should everybody on the planet benefit? Or will the free enterprise model come up? So you're going to expect a whole lot of linkages are going to be going on in the Moon. And this is really what's at the hub of it all when you look at these historic sites in Antarctica or on the moon. Do you have this truly amazing experience and context that only a very few can see, or do you take things to a museum and take them out of context? Clearly the footprints are something that will have to be preserved. The very first human footprints off our planet, and they're gonna be there for a very long time. The remains of, um, if you want to know when something goes from being operational to historic, there it goes. Um, the remains, though, aren't quite everything you would think. They threw all their rubbish out of the uh, little capsule before they took off, so a lot of human waste also got thrown out as well. Um, so it won't all just be pristine scientific things and bits and pieces. Without a doubt, um, if this flag could be in the Smithsonian, I'm sure that it would. I had a friend who worked on the Star Spangled Banner, and we discussed this, and she said that, you know, this is probably the second most famous flag in American history, without a doubt. And I would go as far as to say as human history. Uh, Boeing and General Motors were involved in the rover, so I'm sure for corporate um, sponsorship type things, if you could bring this back to Earth and have an exhibition, American Wheels on the Moon, do you think that would be a bit of a good seller? So when I talked about this at the Smithsonian, I mentioned that you know now is the time to get involved. Use the Antarctic system, which works, and I talked to people in State Department about this. So the nations agree on site designation and management. Visitors are governed by their own national law. So you don't get the National Park Service looking after things. You establish a separate trust. So that whole issue of territoriality gets put to one side. Plan lunar bases for areas that will become historic. South Pole Station, there's a whole lot of issues there. Of, you know, there's, it'd be great if they could have kept those original buildings, but you know, other things have gone over the top of them. And recommending visit Antarctica. Ross Island for the Apollo sites is an analog, and South Pole Station for the new moon bases. When I gave this talk last year, it was all very kind of way out there and a bit of mind candy. Uh, but then Google, um, I was really impressed, came up with the Lunar X Prize. $30 million, uh, if you can get a robot to the moon, you can do a live transmission. And one of the bonuses is if you get to an historic site. And yesterday I got the latest um, guidelines for this particular prize, and they very, very wisely said that visits to historic sites must be approved in advance. Because the whole idea of, and here we have our little robot from University X, and oops, it's just gone over one of those little bags of waste, and something shorted out, and no, it's not responding to control. It seems to be driving towards the American flag. Oh, our sensors show that the motors on the right-hand side are burning up because the flag has been jammed in the wheels. Um, you know, that's publicity from hell. You just don't need that. <laughs> But the fascinating thing of what is being proposed, though, is that it will give the opportunity by remote sensing to show an environment where the vast majority of humans can't go. And I think Google are to be commended for that. So I thank you for coming along the, um, this afternoon. My body clock still thinks it's about 7 o'clock New Zealand time in the morning. Um, but it has been a delight. I'd like to acknowledge Chris for putting this forward. And end on two things. The first is, and this was realized at the time, by going to the moon, we didn't discover the moon as much as we discovered the Earth. When people are up in space and they look back and see this tiny little beautiful marble and they see the vastness of space, suddenly people realize that this is what we've got. The moon isn't an option. You can't live on the moon. You can't make a life in Antarctica. You've got to be continually supplied from the Earth that we live in and we know so well. And on that note, I'd welcome any questions and comments. And if people would like to come up and chat, or if you've got to get back to making the world a better place, I'll end it there. Thank you so much.
Sure. Um, besides criminal funding, I mean, and the fact that most of us are developers or operators yep. or yep. don't have an excuse to get down to the Antarctica, yep. how can we as a company or whatever, besides company, to uh, participate in helping in, I guess, uh, historic uh, preservation and or science? Sure, good question. Uh, two things, first of all, with the heroic era huts, developing technologies that make virtual experiences um, of a deeper nature, and how that is going to be, I'm not entirely sure. Um, certainly, you know, the visual aspect is very important. Um, the second part of the question, I met Peter Fuchs, who was the son of Vivian Fuchs, and he's just set up a foundation in the United Kingdom. And we had a talk, and lots of people were suggesting this idea, not just me. And he said, how do I get British school children engaged with Antarctica? And one of the things is that the human component is very big. So there's a book just come out called Robots in Space uh, from Smithsonian. Uh, one of the authors, and he talks about how the human identity thing is huge, but how the robots actually do far better science and in a lot of environments where humans can't go. So what the Fuchs Foundation has done is chosen a couple of people to go to Antarctica and do their blogs and people, school children especially, can follow the individual and get that empathy, but at the same time also given them access to a lot of data. So they can actually start to do some science. And that whole idea of being able to do science through remote sensing, for example, in Mount Erebus, there are some cameras. And um, they've got a lot of problems with the cold because the batteries um, run down, but some new technologies may help. But that's where a lot of science is going to happen in the future. So developing ways in which children and other people can access data and you know, just analyze it, you know, do it themselves, put it into Excel or another version like that, and, and just sort of see, well, okay, what is the temperature doing? You know, can I compare it to the temperature in this area over the last 100 years? You know, very simple tools that let people take data and get some meaning from it and experience it themselves would be a major contribution. Cool. Sure. In terms of the uh, ice core you talked about, yep. and the that were going back in time, how far back can they get from the ice core samples? At the moment, they've got one where they're going back hundreds of years in great detail, you know, for looking at chemicals and so on. Other ones are going back tens of thousands of years. Um, you know, and then when you're looking at these rock samples, you know, you're getting into some pretty deep history as well. So, you know, there are places where they're looking at the Earth's temperature over, you know, hundreds of thousands and getting into millions of years. And that's part of the debate. And it's an interesting debate that goes on at the moment of climate change, of, you know, what is normal, what can be done, and a lot of scientists have made the comment to me that they're very frustrated that certainly within the British, um, you know, a lot of the world now goes, climate change is happening, we don't need to do any more research. And the scientists are saying, well, actually, if you did a bit more research, you might get some idea of the parameters and the possibilities. And from that, you can do some planning. So for example, is um, you know, the sea level going to go up 300 millimetres or 800 millimetres? Um, well, that makes a huge difference to planning cities over the next 100 years. But there's now, OK, well, climate thing, oh, right, terrible, you know, and, and so you know, suddenly things run off on tangents and so forth. But yeah, that ability you know, to get that record out of there is exceptionally good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Hey, well, look, once again, many thanks. If any of you want to come up and have a chat or whatever, I thank you for this opportunity once more. Have a good day now. Thank you.